a book of Psalms. And we'll be in Psalm 73, and we'll start with the first three verses. You know, a lot of people think, just associate the Psalms with, well, David wrote them. Uh, well, this is one that was written by Asaph. And uh, he says in Psalm 73, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, Asaph is an example of a believer who had lost his focus. And as we examine this psalm today, Psalm 73, we need to ask ourselves the question, how wise is it to doubt God and to envy the foolish? And so we're going to break this down and take a look at it. And what I see in the first few verses, the first verse especially, is Asaph's confession of faith. He said, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And, and he was counting himself as one of those that was pure in heart. And Jesus used the same language in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And then Psalm 9.1 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. Now, this is really something very important here. Because Asaph said that he would give thanks, not half-heartedly, but with all of his heart. Then he said, I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. And if we develop that type of a habit where we are wholeheartedly serving God and his goodness is a part of our conversation, we'll not get tripped up on the slippery slopes of life. And we see that in the expression of doubt in the next verse, Psalm 73, 2. But as for me... My feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. He was no longer walking in that path that he should have been walking. Walking, You know, in Psalm 1, it speaks about blessed are those who walk in the path of God, who walk in the path of righteousness. And, uh, and, God, and Psalm 23 speaks about letting the Lord lead us into, into the green pastures. Well, Asaph was getting off track in his life. He was not trusting God with all of his heart as he had been. And Solomon said in Proverbs 3, a very familiar passage of Scripture, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, isn't that reminding you of what Psalm 9 1 said? Give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. So here in Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs 3, Solomon says, Trust in the Lord with your all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. And when it says, lean not on your own understanding, it means do not prop yourself up with, with your own righteousness or your own wisdom or your own, un, own, own understanding. Instead, in all your ways, submit your life to God. And you know what it's like to prop somebody up. It's, it's like trying to set, uh, keep your balance on, on a stool with one leg. It's pretty hard, isn't it? If somebody comes along, they just kick the one leg and you're down on the ground. And the same, that's the same way with faulty reasoning. Then I see the obsession of envy in verse number three. He says, for I envy the arrogant, and here's three words that are very important, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He had changed his focus instead of focusing on the goodness of God, instead of turning his attention away from God, turning it towards the world and, and, and on the prosperity that he saw some people having. By the way, folks, this is the only heaven that wicked are going to have. And we have something much better waiting for us in heaven. But he got to the point where he was envying the arrogant. He said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That reminds me of what John said in 1 John 2, 15 and 16. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that was the mistake that Asaph was making. Temptation will travel into your life in one of those three avenues. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. And it's the very same problem that got Adam and Eve into trouble in the garden. When they saw the tree was good to make them wise, they disobeyed God. And Asaph said, when I saw, when I took my focus off of God and began to try to prop myself up with my own understanding, I began to focus on what I thought was the prosperity of the wicked. You know, if we're not careful, 
An idle mind will begin to idolize the here and now and jeopardize the there and then. And Asaph had turned his attention to the here and now instead of the rewards awaiting us in heaven from living a life that's pleasing to God. Louis Perry Schaefer, a wonderful theologian, said, Sin is self-centered living and action on the part of the creature who is by creation designed to be wholly centered in God and Asaph was no longer centered in God. He, he had allowed himself to slip and got himself into trouble. You see, life without God is an optical illusion and it will always lead to spiritual confusion because there's more to life than meets the eye. Psalm thirty-three twenty-one says, In him our hearts rejoice for we trust in his holy name. And as long as we are trusting in his holy name, and as long as we are rejoicing in God, we don't have room to get led astray by the false philosophies of the world. But it's when we take our hearts and when we take our eyes off of God, we begin to measure our lives by the treasures of the world and we get into trouble. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, I, I can remember when I was a kid, I bought my first car. It was, a, it was a 61 Ford Fairlane. To me, it was the most wonderful car there was. I, I bought it with my own money. I did body work on it, you know, and, and, and worked on the motor, and, and uh, I would shine it up and everything. It wasn't the fanciest car around, but I was proud of it. And I made sure I kept it shined up and kept it in good shape and changed the oil. And, and uh, I had to carry a pair of slip joint pliers because the solenoids always went bad and you'd have to pop the hood and jump the solenoid across to get it started. But that was just a minor thing, you know. But we ought to take care of our spiritual lives the way that we do that first car that we had or whatever that is that we treasure in our lives. And, and if we don't, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. Proverbs 16, 16 says... How much better to get wisdom than gold to get insight rather than silver. And Asaph wasn't looking at God as he should and was not looking at the world as he should either. When he looked at the world, and this is all out of Psalm 73, we're not going to take the time to read those eight verses, but he saw their health and thought their, their bodies were healthy and strong. He, he thought they were living the good life, but you say we're still plagued by, by human ills, even though he could not realize it. He looked at their pride. He said it's their necklace, their iniquity. And then he said their callous hearts come from iniquity. But yet he was not seeing any punishment for that. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. He said they scoff and they speak malice, but God, you're, you're letting them prosper. And Why? Their boastful words, their mouths lay claim to heaven, their popularity, their people turn to them instead of turning to God and their blasphemy. They say, how can God know? And they were always carefree and Asaph said they increase in wealth. He was doubting God because he saw the prosperity of the wicked, of the wicked and God was not judging that wickedness. Wherever there is an excision of God in this life, there will eventually be a collision with God at death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. You know, we need to be more like Moses. When he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now here it is. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. We're told in Hebrews 11 that he was looking ahead to that future reward. And then I see the foolish progression in Psalm 73, verses 13 through 14. He says, Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. He said, I've tried to live for you, God. Things are not going my way. I, he was doubting, and, and he was saying, look how wicked these people are, God, and you're not doing anything about it. That reminds me of Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 11 and 13. Listen to this. It's happening today in the day and hour in which we're living. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. 
Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be, will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. The problem in Asaph's day that had him doubting is the same problem we're seeing in, in society today, that evil deeds are not being sentenced. We are not even hardly slapping somebody's hand and we're turning them out. And, and you ask the mayor, he finally woke up in New York City, what the problem is, and he, said, he says it's the prosecutors not judging these people. Now, I came across some interesting statistics. Crime has exploded in cities that have elected what this article called rogue prosecutors. In the five years between 2018, so that'd be 2013 to 2017, there was an average of 271 homicides per year. Since 2018, there have been an average of 457 per year. Non-fatal shootings have risen from an average of 1,047 per year to 1,588. Aggravated assault while armed with a handgun went from 2,209 to 300, to, excuse me, to 3,116 per year. Retail thefts went from 7,400 to about 9,000 per year. And auto theft went from 5,691 to 8,665. That was in Philadelphia. Chicago's having the same kind of problems. We're seeing it smash and grab problems in Wichita, Kansas. And it's because... We are not dealing with the problems of the world and just like that was a problem in Asaph's time. He began to doubt God. I hear people asking me, are we living in the last days? What in the world is going on in the world? Well, in 1 Peter 5, 8, the apostle said, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And then he said, resist him. And the way to resist him and the way to remain firm in the faith is to practice being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's what Jesus calls us to be. In 3 John chapter 1, it says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Pastor Paul Tripp said, If you don't keep the eyes of your heart focused on the paradise that, that is to come, you will turn to this poor fallen world, you will turn this poor fallen world into the paradise it will never be. You see, unfounded depictions lead to ungrounded predictions. And that's why uh, Asaph said in verses 13 and 14, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. He was looking at the world instead of looking at God and he was saying I've got more problems than I can deal with and he was making the same mistakes that we make in our own lives. When our lives are not going the way we think they ought to, do, ought to go, when the world seems to be getting worse and worse, sometimes we say, God must not care. But that's not what the Bible teaches. 1 Peter 5 says, 7 says we're to cast all of our cares or anxieties on God because he cares for us. People think when I pray and nothing happens, God's not hearing me. But that's not what the prophet Jeremiah 33, 3 says. He, tells, he says, call to me and I will answer you and I will teach you great and mighty things that you do not know. We wonder where God is. Asaph said, are you awake, God? Are you present? How, how come you're letting this go on if, you, if you're present? Well, in Hebrews 13, 5, we got the promise that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. And then I see Asaph's powerful profession. He said, I got my spiritual senses back in verses 16 and 17. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply, here's the key, until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. John Stott said one time, a British theologian, God intends us, you and me, Christians. God intends us to penetrate the world. Christian salt has no business to remain snugly in elegant little salt shakers. Our place is to be rubbed into the secular, secular community as salt is rubbed into meat to stop it from going bad. One can hardly blame unsalted meat for going bad. It can't do anything else. The real question to ask is, where is the salt? 
the question we need to ask ourselves is, am I praying as I ought to be praying? Am I reading the word as I ought to be reading it? Am I interacting with society in a way that I should as the salt of the earth and the light of the world to try to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Asaph made the mistake of comparing his life to an ungodly world instead of comparing it to God's dictates and commands. He lost his godly perspective. To make sure we do not lose ours, we need to remember several things. Number one is regardless of how bad the world might get, God is still good. In Psalm 84, 11, it says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. We need to always remember that God is great. In Jeremiah 32, verses 17 through 19, O sovereign Lord, you did indeed make heaven and earth by your mighty power and strength, and nothing is too hard for thee. We always need to remember that it, 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 we might be living in a time of turmoil, but Jesus is a Savior who offers us peace. In John 16, he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Then in Colossians 3.15 and verse 17, we need to immerse ourselves in the things of God. Paul said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's bow for prayer. Well, Father, as we come now, I want to thank you for Jesus. The Father, we can have peace in him because he has overcome the world. I pray, Father, that we'll live our lives as the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and that we'll examine our lives, Father, to see if what we're doing, we can truly say we're doing it in the name of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing a song of invitation. And I invite you to come today, whatever your need might be, to speak to me about your need of Christ or to pray about some matter. Come as we sing this song.